everyone. Hello, hello. Happy Saturday. And welcome to another episode of Speaking Plain English. My name is Roberta and I am your host for this episode as always. Um, before we go anywhere, I want for you guys to do your good liking, your good sharing, and your subscribing. Make sure you hit that notification bell so that anytime we have a show on that you will be able to catch us because we are always live. So good afternoon. Thank you. I'm sorry. should have said good morning, but it's actually, I said, I should have said good afternoon, but I did say good morning. All right, everyone. So today we have a wonderful guest as we usually do. We are going to have another, um, author highlight and her name is Linda Johnson and she is a cousin of mine. And this woman has 12 books that are available digitally as well as by um, by paperback, which you'll be able to find on Amazon. Um, you'll also be able to find her um, like her on her website, which we will also share. So I'm gonna bring her in. Her name is Linda Johnson. If we can give a good hand and welcome to her. Hey, yay! Hey, everyone. Hey, cousin. Hi, Roberta. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Oh my goodness, thank you. I'm so happy to have you on here. Guys, let me just tell you something. This woman, I call her a writer's writer. She does, I mean, her books are, there are some that are novels and there are some that I love that are actually journals. So I want you to take a moment and introduce yourself to our audience. Yes, my name is Linda Johnson. I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and I've been in New York ever since the age of 11 and a half permanently. Uh, I help women who are held hostage to past trauma from sexual abuse, molestation, rape, and battery. And God has given me this new platform for my business, Positive Thinking Will Make You Happy, Inc. And one of the things that I believe is that we all have a story. You have a story. I have a story. Someone that you know has a story. But the story you need to write is the story you've always been afraid to tell. And I mm. built this platform called Speak Up and Speak Out. And I go into clubhouse rooms and I meet people who have actually been uh, violated victims. Some have uh, crossed the threshold of becoming a validated victor, but some are yet in therapy and on their way. And I believe that providing this platform and giving people an opportunity or a safe space, a non-judgmental place to share their stories, to come forward and speak up and speak out uh, by telling our stories and telling that truth. And listen, your story is your truth. Your testimony is your story. So Absolutely. I am also, yes, I'm also a journal writer. I started journal journaling when I was very young, but I didn't know it was called journaling. I used to write in a diary. But one of the things I realized is that um, writing in a diary is something that's private, that's secret. That's something that should go to your grave. And when someone should pass away, no one should really delve into the secrecy or the treasure, hidden treasure of that diary and share that mm. information. Whereas a journal is a place where, you know, there are various kinds of journals that you can do. But I think that journals and journal writing is based on current events and things that's happening in your family and things that you would want to share with your children, your grandchildren and generations to follow after you. So, yeah. So that's the difference. Um, I, um, I've been writing ever since I was very young and it wasn't until I told my story that I discovered that maybe I should really think about publishing my story. And um, as we get further into the conversation and you ask me about when did I publish or why I published, then I'll get more into that, Roberta. And I'm going to yield the mic back to you, Roberta. <laughs> Thank you so much for that information, because you know what? I never actually thought that there was a difference. I never thought about there being a difference between a diary and a journal. So that that's something to think about. I've, that I've never even considered that. So thank you for that yes. piece of information, because that I, I don't know if there's anybody else who's out here in the audience that, you know, that never put that together. Never thought about it. Never thought yeah. about it. So thank you for that. And yeah. um, I'm going to acknowledge some of the comments that we have here. We have Christian Community Deliverance Center, which is my mommy. And um, <laughs> yep, my mom says me as well on Facebook. Okay, thank you, mom, for commenting on Facebook because I wanted to make sure that we have our Facebook comments coming through as well. So 
yes, we got everything working the way we want it to. And my aunties, Angela and Sheila are here. I'm so glad to have you guys here. Thank y'all so much. Hey, y'all. Uh, Those so are my partners in crime, gonna, you know. Angela yes, and Sheila. Yes. I'm telling you, we go way, way, way back. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get into it. So I want to, I want to start by asking you, Linda, what was it that actually um, started you with writing? When did you start to, to um, like you did share that you wanted, like you were writing a journal, a diary, um, but what made you actually want to, um, to take that a little further? Well, I will say that my mother, Evangelist Ann Johnson. My mother is a writer and my mm. mother has published many books as well. Um, I think that I probably walked right into my mother's footsteps. My mother is a playwright. My mother is a, a uh, she writes novels, short stories. She's um, done a lot of performances that I produced for her. But what really, really made me think about if I didn't tell my story, that this would be a missed opportunity was when I met a woman who happens to be one of my mentors. Her name is Dr. Teneria Drummond Smith. She actually mm. took the time to hear my story. And after hearing my story, she said, you know, I've been praying to God and asking him to send the seventh author. She wanted a seventh author for a book that she published and I'm co-authored mm -hmm. and called Love Grounded by Grace. And that has a summary of my story. So it was after mm -hmm. I did Love Grounded by Grace that I decided, you know what? Let me, let me enroll into some kind of graduate school program and see if there's something out there that has creative writing. And it just so happens that I found out that the school where I earned my undergrad degree, my bachelor's degree, the College of New Rochelle, which is now Mercy College, that they mm -hmm. had one. I said, let me try out. Let me send them some written samples. And when I did, they actually chose me to be in a scholarship program. So oh, that wow. Really, really motivated me and really got me over into thinking that my story was important enough that I needed to publish it. Because guess what? It was the story I was always afraid to tell. But I knew that mm. it would be a powerful story. And it might be so far reaching that not only would it change one person's life or two people's lives, but it could change people's lives all over the world. Right, right, right. And that's that can be a very, very difficult thing, especially if it's something personal and private. Um, you know, <laughs> can, if you if you don't mind, can you just give us a little bit of your story? Just a, just a brief, because we want people to get the books. We want yes. people to, you know, to be able to read, but just just a little bit. All right. Would you, mind if, would, it, would you mind if I show the book? Absolutely. We're yeah, definitely. All right. So I'm gonna show my my but this is the book. Can y'all see this? Yep. This is Violated Victim, Validated Victor. Breaking Which is your most recent book, yes? Right. This is my number one bestseller on Amazon. And this is the awesome. story that I was always afraid to tell. I had written bits and pieces of it. But I never thought that there would ever come a time when I would actually write the book. So basically, mm -hmm. just to give you a summary is this story goes into various scenes of my life, starting from my childhood life, where I share truthfully, truthful scenes and very graphic scenes of my life as a sexually abused child victim. I also go into future times and phases of my life where I show how I began to come out of the shadows of the past mm. trauma. But it wouldn't be until after I was married to my husband that I knew that I still had some kind of problem and I needed more therapy and I needed to talk about this and I needed help. And mm. I talk about this in the, in the story. I also um, share in my story how there are other victims that are out there and I I just began to talk to other people who had a similar like story and I asked for permission to share their stories. Um, and one person in particular who I talk about in the book, if you've read the book or if you get the book, is my cousin I, who I'm going to call, I had to change her name in the book just for her own protection, is Emily. She was abused by my same abuser. And I wow. found out as I got older that there were other victims um, that had not, really revealed that information it wasn't until I was 
over 40 years old that I found out there were more stories. And I said, okay, I have to put the story out. So yeah, basically I'm sharing truthful encounters of my life as a sexually abused child victim. Wow. And I am going to read a comment from Angela and I absolutely agree. She says, your story resonates with so many people. You are helping so many people. And I absolutely concur with that. And um, she's also says, thank you for sharing your story, Linda. I do. I thank you for that because there are so many people, um, men as well as women, because we, we tend to kind of, as we see this whole Johnny Depp thing going on right now, um, yeah. but we see there's, it's, it's harder sometimes for men to come out and say, but men as well as women are uh, experiencing this type of abuse, um, abuse period. It's, you know, yeah. and it's harder for them to talk about it. So for I Emmy mean, and for us as well, because a lot of times when you're young, you know, you are told, you know, that, you know, you have nobody will believe you or, um, you know, that you'll get somebody in trouble. There's so many different reasons why people wait until they're older to actually, you know, plus it's embarrassing. You know, it's embarrassing to have something like that. You don't want to be, you know, part of, you know, so, so much into the eyes of people. You don't want people to, you don't, you wonder, you know, whether or not somebody will actually believe what you say and things like that. So thank you. Thank you yeah, for and, that. And, you know, another thing I want, so many people. I want to mm -hmm. tag on to that also, as you said that about other people sharing our stories. When I began to share my story publicly, um, with the awesome women on the move, we would go to different places like libraries and churches and so forth. Every time I would share my story, there would be two or three people that would come up to me afterwards and say to me, you know, I went through the same thing when I was younger as a child, but I was afraid to tell somebody. I spoke mm -hmm. at college, even my own college. And I can recall that uh, I was talking specifically to the cheerleaders and some of them began to cry. And I said, oh, my God someone's been touching these young people, doing things to these young people. And, uh, you know, there were stories where young girls and boys have been sexually abused by their own parents, not just men, but women too. Wow. When I'm saying women abusers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I've done a, yeah, I've that's done a lot of research. And it's very, it's a very painful, hard truth uh, that we've been dealing with for such a long time. And we've heard the stories in the Catholic church about the priest and the, the young, the usher boys and so forth being sexually abused mm -hmm. by the priest. We've even heard stories about um, the schools. This has been happening right. even in our, in our churches. So I started mm -hmm. hosting this show uh, that Elder TJ Williams um, asked me to co-host with him when I shared my story, he asked me when I share it on hard truths. And we began talking about this particular subject on hard truths. So yeah, there's mm. some stories, Roberta. And I hope that telling my story and sharing my truth will really motivate others to not only share that truth, but also to get help. That's it. Yeah. That's it help. right there. Cause it's one thing to talk about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's good. Talk first of all, admitting it and talking about it is something yeah. that helps. But what you want to do is we want to definitely, um, I, um, I've said this several times. I am an advocate for therapy and counseling. Yes. I really do. And the reason why is because you can easily, you know, it's hard to find people to actually talk to about it. But when you go to um, a professional, I specifically um, believe in Christian counseling. Because yeah. we're, I like that we can use the word of God as well as science, you know, the, ther you know, the therapeutic, um, op you know, ways to actually, cause there are, there are professionals that ask trigger questions. Yes. And the thing, the, the thing is, once you have all of that stuff that's built in and that's held in, yeah. it does something to your mental state and it does it something does. to your physical health as well. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people may not realize that and understand that. So, I mean, I, I understand that we're talking about you as an author, but this is major. This is absolutely major. This is why I, I really wanted for you to be able to be on this platform because not only you have a story to tell, and as um as you said, um everybody has a story of some sort. Everybody has a story of some sort, and absolutely. I like this comment that Linda um that Angie Angie said. She said to find comfort in knowing that they are not alone. That's right. that's major. That's major because some people yes. feel. 
like I'm the only one going through this or nobody mm-hmm. else will understand and not even realize when you are, are the one to actually tell your story, you know, and to come out and say things, certain things, you don't realize how many other people are, have been deal like you said, have been dealing with the exact same thing. People who, you know, you would never think of, you would never know. Yes. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for that particular story. And that one is a number one bestseller on Amazon. That can be um, purchased on Amazon as well. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So I would like for you to go into, um, I know that some of like a couple of other books that you have, like the, um, like the journals. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that I'm going to be introducing very, very soon is, um, and I had shared this with you, Roberta, when I spoke with you, um, is that I'm going to be introducing a course, a writing course. Yes. And one that, that writing course, the first one is called The Journaling Life. And the second one is called The Creative Writing Life. And I'm going to be sharing more about that in the near future. Um, but one of the things that during COVID-19, um, I did prior to COVID-19, during COVID-19 and still even now, because COVID is still around, right? I began to do these 40 day journals. Um, let me just say, Violated Victim, Validated Victor was supposed to be the very first book that I published. However, mm. the Holy Spirit led me another way. I didn't understand why, but I invested all the money that I had at this time into my very first book, which was a real time journal. And that book is entitled Positive Thinking will make you happy, mind, have that body, and soul. And that particular book, for such a time as this, it was supposed to be uh, a book to help me to earn, to make money, to raise money, to put out my story. But it didn't happen that way, Roberta. What happened is one day the Lord spoke to me and really through somebody else and said, you know, Linda, it's not so much about the money more than it is about the message. That's it. And then I began to think we lost so many people during COVID-19 that had I not put out positive thinking will make you happy and make that really my main mission, my main message, my main focal, focal point to help people who were hurting, people who were grieving and that type of thing. So I said, you know, I wanted to give something back during COVID-19. So I started my own Facebook live called Story Talk. I'm still on a break yes. right now. And that's because I'm working on my writing course and a couple of other books that I just, one I recently put out, put out and another one I'm yet to put out. But even with all of the journals, I wanted to give something back. So I did Facebook live and I invited people to join me on Clubhouse. And I began to do these real time 40 day journals. And guess what? Mm. I did, I challenged myself and I did three journals at the same time and they're all wow. published. Every one of wow. them. Are published. So someone that I was coaching said to me, you know, everything that you've been teaching me, this is the beginning of, of COVID-19. Have you thought about putting this in a book for other people to buy? And that's wow. what gave me the idea to write guided journaling books. So, yeah, so I have a whole bunch of them out there now. And they're wow. all available on Amazon. So if you go to Positive Thinking Will Make You Happy and look up the first book, just click on my name and it'll take you right to my author's page and you'll see the other journal books. So yeah. Can you give us the names of some, some of them? I know I have the, the Positive Thinking Will Make You Happy when that one, that's something. And the thing is, what I love about that one in particular is how it, it, it kind of forces you in a way to Can find the positive. That? No. Mm-mm. And you're going to, there we go. Bring it up a little bit more. Put it in front of your face. Up a little bit. There we go. Kind of. It's flashing in and out. I'm going to have to have my husband come. He'll t- Well, there you there go. There we go. Right there. Keep it right there. Keep it right there. Keep it right there. And you see the, the face. There's like a face in the corner. And on the back of the book, there's like a, uh, a rainbow. Mm-hmm. A rainbow. I'm telling you, I had to really, when I really looked at that, all those details are so strategic. I promise you. <laughs> I have, it's, hey, you have, there's a lot in that background. And there's another my one, my bright ideas. ideas. My bright ideas. That journal. one is the creator. I believe that one is, that's for basic, basic, basically for the creators. Yes, absolutely. Innovative. 
And that's the creator's we dream, journey. We did a dream journal. We did all of this oh, together. Oh I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm sorry, but I have this. Uh, what do you call the screen? There Virtual we go. Background. Virtual this background. Is, this is a dream journal. Yep. See it. And I explained to people when we did the dream journal. I started doing dream journals years ago. And I'm going to tell you one good thing about a dream journal. Dream journal, a dream journal is like if you go to sleep at night and you have a dream, you jot it down. Whatever you can, when you wake up, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, write down whatever details you know about your dream. Just write it down so you don't forget it. It might be sloppy or whatever because you're half asleep. But as soon as you get up, you have to write it down, right? And then when you finally wake up and you're <laughs> you're in your, your conscious state of mind, you write it down, everything you can remember based on what you jot it down. Hmm. But if you don't have a dream, think about doing these 40 days. What are your dreams? What is your dream? Maybe hmm. you aspire and you dream to be a doctor, an attorney. Um, maybe you want to be a fashion designer, an artist, a singer, a writer, a dancer, whatever it is. Think about those dreams and then write something pertaining to those dreams down. Write it on the page. And I tell people all the time, when you journal write, if you don't know where to get started, because it, believe it or not, I had one person I coached that's a writer, that's a published author. She said, Linda, you know, I'm a writer, but I don't like to write. I'm like, what? <laughs> How are you a writer and you don't like to write? Right. Well, she said this to me and I said, you know, I said, wow. So this is what gave me the idea. If you don't know where to get started, just start with one word, one word at a time. And I promise you, if you write one word every day for like, let's say a week or two weeks, and then in the next two weeks after that, go back to those same one words and maybe take those one words and make a sentence or mm. an across the form. And then maybe two weeks after that, Go back to those same one words and maybe write a paragraph, 50 words, 100 words. And before you know it, you would, would have developed a regular habit of journaling. Wow. So journaling will give you immediate story ideas. Journaling will help you to relieve stress in your life. Journaling Absolutely. helped me through the grieving process. I even put out uh, a book. And that one is one of my most recent journal books. And that one is called, um, I'm going to show this to you. This is my methods, tips, secrets, and benefits. Journaling through grief. I don't know if y'all can see this one, but mm -hmm. this one. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're right there. Yeah, this one was, was a little difficult because I lost so many people, Roberta. Well, you know, we've lost a lot of people during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. But I wanted yes, yeah. to get people over into writing about that hurt and that pain and that grief, whatever it was that they were feeling or going through. And you'll be surprised how much journaling can help you. That and is I'm, so necessary. Yeah. I, I'm a strong believer that when you talk about these things to me, me, my journaling, like when we read the Bible, the Bible is God's love letter to mankind, right? Mm -hmm. Well, my journals is my love letter to God. That's the way wow. I give back, sharing those thoughts, jotting those thoughts down, because I'm basically having a conversation with God. When I'm writing in my journal, most of my journals is I'm I'm focused on mindset and I'm coming from a, a spiritual minded um, state of mind of where I am where I'm going and where I hope to go in my future. So, mm. you know, having an op optimist outlook on my future is very important in the journaling process. So, yeah. Wow. So we have a question on the floor. Yes. Angie wants to know, do you think all conversations a person has in one day can equate to one book of information? Absolutely. And I know most people will probably say absolutely not, but I'll say absolutely. Let me tell you something. I can write a book in a day. I can talk to five people, 10 people. And I've challenged myself to do something like this, doing a random survey just to get information. And I actually mm -hmm. did that with my book with Violated Victim. I never told you this, Angie. I never ever told her that. But yeah, I went to a hotel to do the final rewrite of my book and editing. I did it all myself. And... I met people. There happened to be a women's conference 
a three-day conference that was going on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And it was a whole church there. And then there were other wow. people outside of the conference that were there. And I began to meet people and ask them questions. And I mm -hmm. utilized that for something else that I did outside of my book. And I'm like, yeah, so absolutely, Angela. That's a good question. It really is. It really is. So let me ask you something, because one thing that I have major issues with is just walking up to people and talking to them. So I know that surveys are really, really good ways to kind of, you know, get information for different yeah. books. So yeah. how do you muster for those who are, who may want to do things like that? What do you do to muster up the strength to do that, to just walk up to a person and just introduce yourself and talk to them? Number one, you have to have confidence. That's number one. You have to have confidence and you have to show that person that you are confident. Because if mm -hmm. someone walked up to me and they were like, kind of like shy or unsure of themselves, I probably wouldn't want to waste too much time talking to them because I'm like, <laughs> OK, they're, they want to talk to me, but they're afraid to talk to me. You have to let a person know that. Let me just put it this way. As a woman of God, I don't want to just be interesting to people. I want to be interested in people. You have to let mm. people know that you are interested. So whatever your subject title or area is, you have to let the people know that you are interested in what they have to say about it. And I think when you come from that kind of energy and people can feel that energy, they'll gravitate towards you just because of that. Mm. Yeah. Wow. But another That's thing about, about doing your survey, you have to have a purpose. When you read a book and statistics is given from within a book, those statistics was based on some kind of uh, survey that they did. Right. If, it's, if, they, if you're reading a book about um, some kind of medical book, weight loss book, maybe they took a population of 100 people and they had 100 people to eat a certain way. Mm. Maybe the men, they maybe their um, results were different from the results for women. Maybe the results for the older generation compared to the younger generation was different for men and women. You know, maybe there was like a median somewhere where everybody had the same results. So you, mm -hmm. have, to, you have to have an idea for the population that you want to target. Most of the st statistics that we have when it comes to like medical they're using mice and rats and animals, not really yeah. people, not really people. So you have to really think about um, the population. You have to think about what is it that you're really looking for. But if you're really, really wanting to get real time results, you have to have some kind of time frame in which you're testing this population of people or whatever mm. it is that you're doing to get those results. And th that's what your statistics will be based on based on the results. And that sounds to me like you're saying in a nutshell, just to sum it up, is your purpose for it has to be greater than how you feel about it. There you go. That's exactly okay. what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> that um, that right there is, that, that makes sense. That makes so much sense. Hold on, I'm sorry, I'm getting a call and I'm trying to decline it. Whenever I read a book, Can you guys yeah, whenever I'm reading Can you a book, the first thing I want to know, wow, this is a great book. And I'll give you an example. You ever read the book Jane Eyre? If you haven't, most people read it in college or maybe in that senior year of high school. And Jane Eyre, uh, you may have heard of the Bronte sisters. They're authors. They're, uh, they, they're British uh, literature writers. And the thing is, when you read the book of Jane Eyre, you're going to love this character. You're going to fall in love with the protagonist, right? But if you read the book, Jane Eyre is the hero in this story. Mm. So I want to know, wow, the author, who is Charlotte Bronte, why did she write this book? You know, I want to do an author study to find out as much as I can about the author who wrote this book and why did they, what motivated her to write this book. But then there's another author that took, I want to call it a flat character in the book, The Story of Jane Eyre. And she wrote another book about this flat character who is the woman in the attic in the story of Jane Eyre. So she mm -hmm. is like an antagonist. So this woman, her name is Jean Rice, R-H-Y-S-S, -S, something like that. 
And she wrote a book called Wives Sargasso Sea. This is the story about the woman in the attic. After you read that book, I promise you, you will not feel the same way you feel about Jane Eyre anymore. Because it wow. made me realize the importance of studying an author. There were a lot of prejudices <clears throat> during the that time, you know, in history. I believe it was like 18th century or something like that. There were a lot of um, racial discrimination. And this character in Wide So Girl So See, this flat character in Jane Eyre, the woman in the attic, she she was Creole. So she was raised around black people. So when the man that she married in Jane Eyre, the story of Jane Eyre, this man, Mr. Rochester, who's a very wealthy man, he married this woman named Antoinette. But when he found out that she was Creole and she was raised around like black people, he disowned her. That's prejudice. Mm. So he stuck her in the attic because back then there was no divorce, right? There was no divorce. You know, and it's some really sad parts to her story. But when you hear her story, it's it's just so sad. Even though this this is very clever of a writer to take any character in a book, a flat character that you might see them here and there, but you don't hear too much about them. Like take, for instance, a butler or the maid. Who knows the story of the maid or who knows the story of the butler? Do we really know Alice's story from the Brady Bunch? Right. Right. I would it was great to get this point of view. Yeah. That's just a good example to give you. So yeah. You know it's funny? Now that you mentioned that there there is one woman that I said, um, like there's you know how people have questions, like if you had, you know, if you wanted to speak to anybody in the world, who would you want to speak to, you know, whether they're dead or alive? Yeah. I want to talk to Noah's wife. Ooh. I would love to hear her story. Ooh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> because That's story like from the Bible. Right. Yeah. she has had out she would have to have I would love to get her point of view because I understand you know you know it, it's something like when you you're married you know your husband and everything but for I'm sure that her mindset in the very beginning I wonder I'll put it like this if her mindset in the very beginning was the same as everybody else's like this man is nuts like is he really out here trying to talk about he first of all he heard God tell him to build yeah, a boat yeah. it's huge I real I would love to get her story. I would love to hear her story. Don't get me started because we could start that story like right now for real. Don't play with me. Don't play with me. And that could be a play too. And I know somebody else that Carlene would be amazing for that. Oh let's listen. Let's let's so we may we have to get together and work on this. Real for real. (laughs) Seriously. So y'all stay tuned for this one. So y'all just got a little bit of a exclusive of what's to come because we're gonna do this. We're gonna do this. You know, so I have another question for you. Yes. You know, and I because I like what you said. Like there are different people's points of view, people that are so-called in the background. Like you never want, you know, you never know who the fly on the wall is and what they saw. Because at the end of the day, their point of view is actually, I would like to say more accurate than the main characters. Yeah. And that's just, you know, that's just my opinion on that. Yeah. So I have a question for you. I want to know, um, as far what do you, what would your what would you say that's your favorite um, your favorite genre is to read and to write? I would say drama, action. Um, I love writing um, about scenes where. Like in, for instance, in my, I have a book that I wrote called Standing at the Gate. And we have talked about Standing at the Gate. And that story is about the doctor that commits suicide. So I challenge myself and I'll just show, show this one also. Standing at the Gate, the doctor in her car, her white cotton garment. And she's, you know, actually the thing is like, the gate is really like a metaphor um, throughout Mm -hmm. the story. But we know that when the doctor commits suicide, she finds herself standing at the gate in heaven, right? But the thing is to write the scene of her drowning, that I just like challenging myself as a writer to actually, I could actually, I could have probably written chapters of this doctor drowning herself. Wow. And maybe that's an idea. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can write volumes on just that. Yeah. I mean, there, I like 
action scenes, things that's happening. Um, like if there's a movie you like, the, the movie, one of my favorite movies is Speed. You know, with Sandra Bullock. It's a good movie. Yes. And Keanu Reeves. That was a good movie. Yes. And I'm going to tell you something. When you, when you, they always say it's better to read the book before you watch a movie. It's true. I don't know if there was a mm -hmm. book or not, but I do know, I would wonder how, what the writer write that scene, you know, uh, or um, I'm trying to think of a, a, a movie that's packed with action. I love speed because it was action, action. You're constantly on like, From you know, start to finish. Like, yeah. And it's like, okay, what's going to happen next? How are they going to stop this bus without the bus blowing up? You know what I mean? So this is the kind of stuff, like I thrive on this kind of stuff that's happening in a story. Um, I don't like scary movies, even though there's always a lot of action taking place um, or in books that's like uh, Fright. Fright Night or what is it, Jason, uh, Friday the 13th, horror. I don't like horror, but I can tell you, to write them, you will get, you can be very graphic as you want. It can be something as so grotesque as actually describing the murder, how someone was murdered, you know, how a serial killer is murdering someone. I have to read stuff like that, even though I hate it, because it strengthens you and it makes you better as a writer. I as hate writer. genres when it's like love scenes and stuff like that. Don't like it, like erotica and stuff like that. But if you're going to be a writer, you have to challenge yourself and you have to read some of these uncomfortable kind of scenes just to see how a love scene could be written and you could write it better in a way that's not so um, raunchy or, 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 or nasty. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just like to kind of put a twist on things um, and standing at the gate to that point in this book, there's a character that you find out about at the very end. So in part two, you're going to find out more about that character. So I want that to be more of a love story. So that's going to be more of that kind of genre of uh, love love and romance. You know, some people mm -hmm. like love and romance. I don't really like it, but I'm challenging myself to write this kind of genre, love and romance. But I would say it would have to be drama is my number one. To read yeah, or to write? or To read. To read. What about your favorite to write? To, to write? I would say uh, fiction, Christian fiction. Um, mm. Anything that's Spiritually based, because like having a connection with God and being able to um, to convey that in the story, like I'm standing at the gate, my description of heaven. This is this is in my own mind, but I was visualizing in my mind as I'm writing what's happening when this doctor is actually getting a glimpse of heaven. We can only imagine, but to actually write this on the page and for someone to read it, it's like wow. We don't really know what heaven looks like until you get there, right? Mm. But we can only imagine based on what we read in the Bible. Can you imagine the streets that are paved with gold? Can you imagine diamonds, emeralds, pearls, all kinds of the finest jewels all around you? Everything is glittery and shiny. That's the way I envision it. Maybe someone oh. else may have another description. And even when I was writing this, I didn't want to read another author's story about something similar because I didn't want to get any of their ideas. So I would I would say my favorite genre would have to be um, fiction drama. Mm. And that's good because we don't, as Christians, we don't have a lot of yeah. um, you know fictional stories yeah. and movies and things that are um i just like to call them clean comedy clean entertainment we don't have a lot of that yeah so that's actually i honestly think that that's something that is lacking that if you you know are taking the challenge to to write and to you know to bring forth it would do very yeah. well it would do yeah. very well because we're looking for stuff you know what i mean and 
we sh- as as a church we should have everything anyway. We should have mm-hmm. everything that we need and entertainment included. Yeah, you know what I mean. So we should so that we won't have to feel convicted to go anywhere else and still be entertaining. That's the, mm-hmm. the thing that I I I have to I have to um to say about a lot of different shows and movies and things like that that are supposed to be for us. A lot of people seem to think that they have to be corny. No, <laughs> they don't. Yeah. Even when it comes to music, you know, with gospel music or even Christian rap, like a lot of it that I've heard um, a while ago was just garbage. And I'm like, okay, come on now. If we're going to do this, let's do it with some quality. You know what I I mean? So that way we don't have to, that way we don't have, we can give people the option because one, you don't necessarily have to be Christian to enjoy clean entertainment. Some people just don't want to hear it, you know, or don't want to see certain things. So I, I, I applaud you for that. And I think that that's something that may be your avenue to, to go a little further and go a little deeper in. I can tell you one so thing. We have, it's mm-hmm. hard to make people laugh when you write. And if you can do so. that, oh, listen, yeah. if you're gifted to do it and you do it well, you definitely need to do it to the 10th power, especially mm. if you were a Christian. Especially in art in, in um in writing. Yeah. Cause it's simple, it's easier for a person to, you know, to be entertaining visually. You know, like a person is yeah. standing on stage and you're watching something. That's that's oh, yeah. easier to put it like that than than actually yeah. writing something. Cause not yeah. you you have to you have to write it in a way where the person has to actually get it and they have to be, you know, they have to be a part of the story. Right. So that they can actually feel like it's happening in real time. So I get I get that. I understand that 100%. Yes. So we have a comment here from, I think this man is somebody that you know very well. <laughs> this is my cousin. This is her husband, which is, so let me, okay. Wow. This is funny. I'm going to tell you about this is funny because her maiden name is the same as her married name. <laughs> so my cousin who you see with this comment right here, Tommy, that's my blood cousin. And so she is our cousin through him. It's this, um, and we've all known each other since we were, uh, it's funny. It, it's so funny. She used to call me her baby when I was younger. So I'm telling you, life is, is something else. I'm, I'm telling you. So yeah. he says that he was, and this is going back to the comment about whose point of view we would like to, um, to get he he says that he would like to know the story of the husbands of powerful women in history like Rosa Parks' husband Harriet Tubman's Ooh. husband that would be a major story those would be yes. awesome and the reason for that and um because a lot of times I'm I'm just going to you know speak on behalf of some of the men when you have a strong woman who is you know who is the head of um you know who they're put in the forefront sometimes yeah. the the men sometimes the men can kind of feel some kind of way you know like it's 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 hard it can be really difficult for (laughs) and i hear him in the background (laughs) it can be really difficult sometimes for um you know for the roles to kind of be reversed in a way but if to have a support i'll put like this when you are so when you are a strong woman having a supportive husband that is major i have to i have to say that if you have a very strong lead role in life. I'll put it like that as a woman. It's very, very, very important that the um if you're if she's married, you know, with or the men in her life, whether it be the father, whether it be cousins, brothers, friends, whoever, that they're supportive of her. Exactly. Because it's when the tables are turned, we'll get behind you in a minute. You know, we'll get behind you and we'll push you forward and we'll do that. But it's it's difficult. It can be difficult for some men. To you know, to see that their wife is getting all of this attention. So those would be some major awesome stories. So yeah. Tommy, I listen. I I like that. I like that. And we have another comment from Angie when you were talking about um what we think that you know heaven would look like from the um from the book. How she's saying that she does she can't wait to get there. Mm-hmm. And we also have her saying you know that 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 was a good statement talking to Tommy. And th- yes, the sound effects. <laughs> Absolutely. The sound effects in the background. You you know something so, in creative in creative uh, writing. One of the things I wanted to say um, is that as it pertains to 
you you were talking about something you visualize and then something you actually have to read when you're watching mm-hmm. a movie and then the way you read it. I want to challenge everyone that's listening here today. The next time you watch a movie, if you didn't have a chance to read the book and there's a book available, it would be great if you can read the book first so you can kind of create your own vision of what this world looks like that the author, the writer is actually portraying um, or to the reader. But if you mm-hmm. can actually watch a movie and then read the book and see how it's written, it's a big difference. Mm. How the how the the writer focuses on sound, on the on the five senses, right? You know, seeing, speaking, what they're hearing, what they're mm-hmm. seeing, even smell, mm-hmm. taste, and tasting, and feeling. Right, I'm telling you, it's amazing when you do it creatively, and if it's done right, oh my goodness, and. It's always uh, harder to do it in second and third person. It's easier to write action scenes to me in first person when you're writing it yourself. And if you're writing it in first person and like I'm writing about myself in my own story, it's easier for me to write those graphic scenes because this is what happened to me. Hmm. But when you actually have to write it about a character and you may be writing it not in first person, but maybe you're writing it in third person, Second person, in my opinion, is the hardest to write. And if you can write Mm -hmm. in second person, oh my goodness, you've taken writing to a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. And that's just based on my personal experience with books I've read and writers I've written with, I've written alongside over the years. Yeah. Wow. I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about um, the one that you, the book that you were just talking about a minute, Standing at the Gate. So for those of you who have, I haven't heard, I haven't read the whole thing yet. But I do remember hearing an excerpt that um, like the beginning and you gave us a synopsis of what that's about. I want to tell you, thank you for that, because that's something like the theme of it is pretty much is a woman who um, I would I would gather. Correct me if I'm wrong. People felt like maybe or thought that they she had it all. She was a doctor. So if a person is a doctor, you would also you want to believe, oh, they've got, you know, everything that they need. They've gotten the school and they've gotten the degrees. They've got the money, this, that and everything else. But the woman um, had been dealing with some things. And so she committed suicide. And yeah. so she goes into the story from what I'm understanding. You just do such an amazing um, job in describing what she was feeling during that time. And that is something that I think that, um, especially that we are closing the mental health awareness month that we need to really, really take time to think about. And I'm actually going, this is just as a prerequisite, we're going to be talking about that in some of the episodes for next month for June. Um, so I want you guys to stay tuned and let's talk about that because it's personal for me and you'll find out why that's personal for me. But, um, I want to, we only, we're not really, we have a, only a few minutes left. So first I just wanted to, 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 you know, to, to touch on that a little bit as you have already done, but before we close, first of all, thank you so much for You're taking welcome. the time to, to come out and to, you know, to talk about writing and talking about being an author and the different things that goes into it because it's not easy. Yeah. Is that we didn't even get into the whole thing about writer's block <laughs> just yeah. yet. Yep. It's well, a real thing. Did. It's a real thing. Yeah. It happened to me right before COVID. Mm. I, wrote, I wrote in my journal book on, I think it was January the 16th or the 17th. I wrote one word, sadness and a sad face. And I couldn't write for like almost like a whole month. Not knowing what was to come. Wow. Literally sadness is Mm -hmm. what I felt and I couldn't write and I didn't know why. Wow. So this is before, before COVID-19 it's in my journal. Oh my goodness. That's something that is something. So it's like God was preparing you before it even happened. Yeah. All right. It's something else, man. It's something, it's something else. So what I would like for you to do before we close out is I want you to, um, you know, just address the audience and give us some, um, what I like to do. I like to end on a positive note, which is amazing because your company is called positive thinking will make you happy. Inc. Yes. Love it. 
So I want you to just give us, um, you know, some words of encouragement, not just necessarily only to authors, but just to our audience as in general. And I'm going to put information at the bottom. So if you want to reach out to her, if you um, want to, you know, see how, you know, you want to connect with her, or if, even if you want to send her a little something to her cash app, or if you want to order her books, this is how you'll be able to contact her. Her information is scrolling on the bottom. So you got the floor. Thank you, Roberta. Um, yes, I, I want to say one of my, my new model in 2022 and going forward is if if some of us will help one of us. One of us can help all of us. And anything that I do, whether if it's an in-person meeting, a telephone conversation, a virtual platform such as we are here today, I wanna leave you all with the scripture that aligns with my mission and my message for positive thinking will make you happy. And that scripture is found in the book of Philippians chapter four, verse eight. And it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things and those are all positive things. And I believe that a positive attitude will get you through anything that you are going through. Thank you, Roberta. And God bless. I believe that. I believe that with my entire heart. Thank you so much again. Thank you to all of you who are taking the time to hang out with us on this Saturday afternoon. Remember again to like and share and subscribe and do all that wonderful stuff that'll keep us to, you know, be able to continue doing this. And if you decide that you want to go ahead and, you know, support our um you know, positive, not positive thinking, I'm sorry, speaking plain English as well. I'm going to give you a way to do that. You can send whatever your donations would be like to, you know, to cash app. There's, there are different finances and things that do need to go into this. So thank you guys again so much um, for all that you do. Thank you, Linda, again, for all that you do. Stay tuned for our outro. And until next time. Bye-bye.